But first, a lot less jolly tale of badgers and cows. The link, of course, is tuberculosis. Badgers in the wild are a reservoir for bovine TB, which is a nasty disease for cows, and can transfer into the human food chain. How to deal with this ongoing threat has caused controversy for years. And this week, a major report led by Professor Sir Charles Godfrey from Oxford University is published. BBC Science correspondent Palab Ghosh has been all over this story for several years and gave me the nuts and bolts of this 164-page behemoth. The report was commissioned by the Secretary of State for the Environment, Michael Gove, and he wanted to carry out a review of DEFRA's strategy in trying to bring TB in cattle under control. The strategy's been the same, more or less, for about 10 years. It was time to have a look at what to do next. So he asked Sir Charles and a team of independent scientists to look at all the available evidence and to advise him on what to do next. The most important message in our report is that we have to widen the different strategies that we have to control bovine TB. In the report, we look at multiple possibilities, especially around things such as changing the tests that we use to detect bovine TB, about trying to reduce the frequency of risk-based trading, about investing in new research, and also about the governance of the disease, exactly how we organise control of disease and we also look at the disease in wildlife. Okay, that was Charles Godfrey, lead author of the report on TB in cattle. Palab Ghosh is with me in the studio. Palab, give us a lowdown on the science. What were Sir Charles's main findings? What he concluded was that there was perhaps too much emphasis on TB transmission from wildlife, from badgers, and not enough on the cattle-to-cattle transmission. He urged more research in that area. He also pointed out that the skin test that's used to try and test for TB in cattle isn't as sensitive as people thought and there are more cases being missed and so many more herds that people think are TB-free actually do carry TB and that's probably one of the greatest sources of infection. He's also asked farmers and the government to do more to try and control the transmission through biosecurity arrangements and is also called for more research to develop vaccines and non-lethal methods i.e. not shooting badgers to try and stamp out the disease. Okay well we're going to get into some of the scientific details in just a minute but this has been commissioned by Michael Gove. How has government reacted to the contents of of the report which are you know it's a scientific report with recommendations. We won't know what government has to say until the summer they want to have plenty of time to consider it they're also waiting for some data from the very first trials that started in 2013. There should be some indication of whether they're proving effective or not come January. So they're waiting for those results and then they'll decide what they're going to do in terms of trying to bring this dreadful disease under control. So the two key areas, which are Gloucestershire and Somerset, where there are ongoing culls and they they started a couple of years ago, they are not included in this report. But you say that those data are going to be available in the new year. So why are we publishing this report just two months early of some absolutely essential data that would help us inform the situation? So there are kind of so many reports flying around, it's hard to keep track. There was a report published in September by DEFRA's own scientists about how the culls were going so far. And uh, one of the things they said explicitly was the fact that you couldn't tell at this stage whether the culls were having any effect or not. For that, you needed control areas. So the farming minister, George Eustace, promptly said, oh, this report does show that it's having a beneficial effect, which has enraged vets, with one vet calling him a barefaced liar. We are going to have some indication of a properly carried out experiment as to how the situation in Gloucestershire, Somerset and Dorset are going in January, and that will give us a clearer idea. Sir Charles Godfrey's report doesn't touch on that because he was asked not to. You can speculate as to why he was asked not to. One of the reasons may well be because of the political sensitivity of it all. Yes, as you say, the reaction from, well, certainly from vets has been pretty robust. And we've actually got a clip of Dr Ian McGill, who is the director of the Prion Interest Group. He was the one that called George Eustace a barefaced liar. The report that came out in September, there was a dramatic fall in both incidents and prevalence before culling started, and then it plateaued. For year four, the government used a calculated figure to say that the incidence, that's the risk of new breakdowns, is falling. But actually, we've looked at the 2018 figures, and there's been a huge spike in cases in the Gloucestershire cull zone. 
the number of herds infected has gone up by 29%, and the incidence has gone up by 55%. So these are serious misclamations that they're saying here. These are basically barefaced lies because badger culling hasn't worked. The incidence in cattle is going up again in the Gloucestershire cull zone. And that's just not acceptable for the minister or anyone else, in fact, to claim that badger culling's worked. It hasn't worked. We've proved that, and the cull needs to be called off. Pala, that is pretty strong reaction. That's an incredibly powerful allegation that a scientist can level at a government minister. I think the vets and other people are getting frustrated at the way in which some of DEFRA science is being portrayed. DEFRA has, as you know, some of the best scientists in the world. Their work is top quality. There's nothing wrong with their science. The concern is that how it's portrayed. There's concern that it's being cherry-picked by ministers to suit their policy. And when science is cherry-picked, it stops being science at all. But the wider concern is that DEFRA and DEFRA ministers have to speak about the science in many other subject areas, such as climate change, deforestation, lots of environmental issues. And if it's seen to be economical with the truth, in one area, then it undermines what it says about everything else that's based on its own science. OK, Palab, stick around because there's plenty more to talk about on this. One of the suggestions in the report is that as an alternative to culling, vaccination is approached. And I spoke to trial scientist Rosie Woodruff from the Zoological Society of London. I was involved in a large-scale randomised control trial called the Randomised Badger Culling Trial, which looked at the extent to which you could control cattle TB by culling badgers. And what that suggested was that this was a very risky way to try to control the disease. So if you do culls in a certain way, very, very large scale, simultaneous, long term, large scale, then you can to some extent reduce the incidence of cattle TB inside the area that you cull, but at the cost of increased cattle TB on adjoining land. And if you do quite small scale culls at the size scale of a, a single farm or just a few farms, you actually make the situation worse rather than better. So it's really quite a difficult and risky kind of tool to use in TB control. And that's one of the reasons why there's been a lot of concern about it, because not only is it obviously bad for badgers, but it has the risk of being bad for farmers as well. Yes, it's quite clear that there are complexities within our understanding and the science of how culling might work and whether or not it does. But the report is very clear that it suggests that, though it doesn't call for an end to culling, it suggests that we should embrace non-lethal alternatives. So what are those non-lethal alternatives? So I think it's excellent, in fact, on this, because both farming leaders and farming ministers have been saying repeatedly for years that they don't want to be killing badgers forever. This is not a long-term solution. And I think what's fantastic about this report is that they've said, fine, right, let's look at what the alternatives are. And the principal alternative that they have, in my mind, correctly identified in terms of managing TB in badgers is to look at the vaccination of badgers. How does vaccination in badgers work? I mean, no one doubts the efficacy of vaccination as the ultimate prophylactic. But of course, the practicals of working on the ground are much more complicated. And if culling has been part of it, how does vaccination work if culling has been part of the strategy so far? Well, I think that's a really good question. So what the Godfrey Group have proposed is they're looking at vaccination as an exit strategy from culling. So they have suggested a trial in which after areas have been culled for four years, that then some of the areas, half of the areas would get periodic culling after that four year initial cull and others would get annual vaccination after that initial cull. Now, if you want to evaluate the vaccination specifically as an exit from culling, then that's a good approach to take. But there are two problems with it because culling is going to undermine the effectiveness of vaccination. So Culling weeds out the animals that are easily captured. So if you've been culling for four years, the few badges that are left are going to be more difficult to capture for vaccination. Secondly, vaccination works by protecting animals that have not yet been infected. But culling actually increases the proportion of badges that have got TB. It reduces the numbers, but increases the prevalence. And what that means is that the number of animals that can be protected by vaccination is lower after culling. So for those two reasons, vaccination is very likely to perform less well on badger populations that have been culled in recent years. If you really want to know whether vaccination is an effective TB control tool, not just an exit strategy from culling, but potentially an alternative to culling, 
then what you need is a third element to that proposed trial, which is to recruit some areas which have not yet been culled and simply look at vaccinating those areas from scratch. OK, so let's pretend that I'm the head of DEFRA now and I'm recruiting you as the chief strategist for developing an effective way to remove TB from badger populations and therefore cattle. So what would be your next move? Well, I think that firstly, you wouldn't do it by culling because what we showed in the randomised badger culling trial is that when you cull badgers, every time you come back and cull badgers again the following year, you find that the proportion of them that have got TB has gone up. It's a sort of perverse outcome of badger culling. If I were wanting to eradicate TB from a badger population, I would be looking to vaccination. And I would be looking to trial that. I don't think this is something that we could look at farmers and promise that this is going to work. And so I think one would want to implement it in a way where you were comparing vaccination with some other alternative approach. And I would be looking at annual vaccination going back each year to the same areas on a large scale and be vaccinating those each year. That was Rosie Woodruff from the Zoological Society of London. Palab Ghosh is in the studio with me, who's been writing about this for, well, for a while now. Now, one of the things that Rosie mentioned there is that the report is very clear that the most significant mode of transport is cattle to cattle and not badger to cattle. And that's that's outlined in great detail in the report. You've mentioned also in the report that how we detect TB in cows is potentially problematic. There are a number of tests for TB in cattle, but one of the most popular is the so-called skin test. People knew to start with that it wasn't 100% reliable, but some things better than nothing. But the evidence has been growing that it's even less reliable than they thought. Now, the upshot is that there might be herds that have been thought to be TB-free, that have been passed TB-free by DEFRA vets, but in fact aren't TB-free and are passing the disease from cattle to cattle. So there are more sensitive tests available that are being used in the UK, but they're not widely used. They're not widely used because you get too many false positives. That is that it identifies cattle that haven't got TB as having TB and farmers aren't keen on having cattle slaughtered unnecessarily. But if the trade-off is that herds are still infected, then in the high-risk areas they should be used. So that was one of the the other recommendations from Godfrey. OK, let's take a sort of uh, wide view of this. This is a really important report. I mean, it's absolutely massive as well. In some senses, it's a classic example of government commissioning scientists to do research and then that has to be turned into policy. And over the last few years, I think it's fair to say that that policy has been, well, controversial. So how does this rank as a government trying to engage with scientists in order to determine what policy should be? I think the Godfrey Report has been universally welcomed. It contains lots of good ideas. It's tried to take the heat out of the situation and bring more science into the situation. But the key point is the fact that TB in cattle is a desperately difficult disease to bring under control. And there's a lot of blame flying around. There's a lot of anger, particularly with the the culling of badgers. But at the end of the day, this is a disease that isn't impossible to bring under control. And I think what Godfrey's done is try to get people to think about the problem rather than all the rancour. Palab Ghosh, and before him you heard from the Institute of Zoology's Rosie Woodruff speaking to me from Cornwall, where badger vaccination programmes begin in the spring. Do get in touch, BBC Inside Science at bbc.co.uk. Last week, we featured the Godfrey Report, the government assessment, amongst other things, of the efficacy of vaccinations and badger culling in an attempt to tackle tuberculosis. Needless to say, this is a controversial topic with lots of strong opinions on all sides. And we had stacks of correspondence on the matter, not all complimentary, and we thought it was worth revisiting bovine TB and badgers and trying to really get to grips with some of the science. I spoke to Malcolm Bennett, Professor of Zoonotic and Emerging Disease at the University of Nottingham. We had a long conversation. The full version is on the podcast, which I would recommend if this is a subject that really grinds your gears. You might want to save your emails till after you've listened to that. BBC Inside Science at bbc.co.uk is the address. Now, one of the things that we talked about last week was how the main transmission route for bovine TB was actually between cows. And I asked Malcolm how this actually happens. Bovine TB in cattle is transmitted mainly by the respiratory route, so aerosols, and they get right down to the far end of the lungs. So mycobacterium tuberculosis complex seem to like growing in the lungs. So once it's there, it's taken up like any bacteria that 
get into places they shouldn't be by macrophages. And of course the job of macrophages is to eat bacteria, kill them and present the antigens on those bacteria to parts of the active immune response, so to T-cells and B-cells and that kind of thing. The trouble we have with mycobacteria is they grow in the macrophages. So what we have instead of dead bacteria is a slow-growing mycobacterium that's growing inside the macrophages and gradually that infection expands but it's also being controlled a bit by the immune response although it's not a brilliant immune response because it's hiding from the immune response inside the macrophages so you end up with very small microscopic sites I hesitate to call them lesions really where there'll be some macrophages with dormant bacteria in them, some macrophages with growing bacteria in them. You'll have maybe a little bit of inflammation coming in because there is a bit of an immune response going on. And it can stay like that for months, years, in humans, decades, hiding from the immune response. And we call that latent infection. Mm. So if you're a human, you might live like that for years and then you might have some kind of a stress that knocks your immune system. So it might be HIV, it might be poor nutrition then your immune system can't handle the infection anymore and it takes off and the lesions get bigger and bigger and when they're big enough you get clinical signs and eventually you die. Or it might be that your immune response beats the bacteria, in which case you can completely recover. Or if you're a badger, you probably get run over before any of that develops. Right. I mean, it's a, a complex, sophisticated and pretty cunning bacterial disease. So we in humans, all of us adults, bear the scar on our upper left arm of the BCG that we had when we were 12 or 13, I suppose. Yeah. So we give ourselves a boost, a vaccine to help us identify and remain immunised against TB. How does the BCG work? Okay, so BCG is an attenuated, a weakened, or if you like, knackered strain of Mycobacterium bovis. Nowadays we inject it. Originally it was given orally and that makes an immune response which enables you to get a head start really on the real wild type infection if and when it happens. And we've all got those scars so how effective is it? Ah well uh, that's a big and a controversial question so the figures that tend to be quoted are 70-80% something like that effective but it depends on what species, what population, your background, history in disease, where you come from in the world, whether or not you're immunosuppressed, how good your nutrition is and all that kind of thing. So in different studies, it ranges from about 80% down to no effect whatsoever. We don't know absolutely why we get such different responses to BCG in different populations at different times. Right. So, you know, the picture gets even more complicated the deeper that we delve into it. We had a number of emails simply asking the question, well, rather than culling the badgers or vaccinating badgers so that they don't transmit it to cattle, why don't we simply vaccinate the cows like we vaccinate ourselves? So the simple and quickest answer is to say because it's illegal. And the reason for that is that we can control TB in cattle by testing them. And if they're positive, we cull them. So you look for an immune response and we can't tell the difference between an immune response to the vaccine and an immune response to infection. So if we vaccinated our cows, next year we'd come back to test and cull the ones that were positive and we'd end up culling all the ones we vaccinated last year. In this era of genetics, where we get DNA out of thousands, millions of species with relative ease, is there not a method of trying to identify the DNA of the tuberculosis bacteria rather than looking for... An antigen response? Yes, and I guess the obvious way would be PCR, which is a very sensitive technique for detecting the DNA of anything. One of the problems with TB is that, well, first of all, you've still got to get a sample that has the organism in, and secondly, the structure of the bacteria seems to make it quite difficult to get the DNA out, and as a result of all of that, PCR is nothing like as sensitive as we would hope it would be. There's another test that's being developed at the moment which makes use of bacteriophages, so these viruses which infect bacteria. So there are specific ones which infect mycobacteria, and this test so far it looks to be very, very sensitive and very, very quick, but it's not been validated and there is a lot more work that can be done before it can be completely rolled out. Well, actually, one of our correspondents, William Streetfield, who is a dairy farmer from Somerset. Now, he asked a question which I think is worth addressing, that one of our guests mentioned last week that badger culls in some areas appeared to have the effect of increasing the prevalence of TB, especially in the first few years. But William points out that we didn't really cover the reason why. So, Malcolm, we didn't really go into great depth, so why would 
badger culls increase TB in those areas? Badgers are, I hesitate to use the word territorial, but they're almost territorial, so they tend to stick to the same areas. If you start culling badgers and taking them out, then badgers from outside will move in. The badgers that are in that area will start to move out. There's a lot more contact between badgers and therefore a lot more transmission going on. So at the end of the randomised badger culling trial, the RBCT, there were fewer badgers and fewer infected and infectious badgers in the cull area than at the beginning, but the proportion of badgers that was left that had TB was higher. And that leads to the whole question of what do you do once you've finished culling? Because if you let that population grow back up to the level it was before, then presumably you're going to have even more TB and even more of a risk to cattle and to other badgers. So you have to either carry on culling or you could maybe try immunocontraception, something like that, which has been trialled but isn't really ready to be rolled out properly yet. Or you can vaccinate those badger populations, but then you're asking a really big thing of the vaccine, aren't you? Because you're using that vaccine in a population where a lot of the badgers are already infected, whereas at the moment we tend to vaccinate badgers more around the edges of the cattle epidemic in the hopes of keeping clean badgers clean. So what I'm getting from this conversation is that, well, it's immensely complicated. In some ways, you know, there are more questions than answers. But of course, government has to act because this has an effect. It has an economic effect on farmers out there. And there is the effect of actually culling badgers. So what do you think? What is the most appropriate strategy at this point in time whilst embracing the immense complexity of this area? My personal view is where you have TB in cattle or on the edge of the TB epidemic where you don't have TB in the badgers, then you should vaccinate the badgers. I think that there's no point culling badgers if you don't know whether or not they've got TB. So I think we do need more surveillance about where is TB in badgers. And I think that we need to put a lot more emphasis on biosecurity. With other notifiable diseases, we take that kind of transmission far more seriously. And I'm not quite sure why we don't with TB. And I think that the main message that I got out of the Godfrey report was probably one size doesn't fit all. So we're going to have to have different approaches in different areas of the country where the TB epidemic is behaving in different ways. Malcolm Bennett from University of Nottingham. That is all for now.